Welcome. Uh, my name is Gary Tartikoff, and I'm the faculty chair of the Institute on World Affairs. And before we begin, I wanted to remind you all uh, that the Institute on World Affairs is a small committee open to whoever wants to join it. Anyone in this room is eligible. We have faculty, staff, people from neighboring institutions, people who live in the area uh, who are interested in what goes on at ISU and come and take part in the Institute. Particularly, we have students, graduate students, undergraduate students, former students. Uh, and we'll start uh, two weeks from yesterday at 4 o'clock in the Pine Room, uh, talking over what went on this week, and then we will start looking for a topic for next year. We just try to find the most important possible topic in the world and focus on that. But if there's a topic that you think ought to be discussed here, we ought to have a week of lectures on. If there's somebody who you think is really interesting and you'd like to meet them and hear them, and you'd like to have your colleagues and friends and associates here hear them, come to this meeting, get involved, and find a way to work them into the week. Uh, the first time I ever went and sat in a meeting, somebody handed me something, I came back the next week and they took my topic. It hooked me, that's why I'm here. But I'm saying, uh, if you're interested at all in this, you can be a real big part of it, and we hope you'll come to our meetings. Uh, if you forget when I said it will be, call the lecture office, uh, come by and see us, or talk to me after the meeting here. But uh, if you're interested, please come by and take part. You can assemble this week for next year, and we'd like to have you take part. Thank you. Laura. And right after this lecture, go vote. Before I introduce this afternoon's speaker, I would like to remind you that tomorrow at noon in the Pioneer Room, Mitsuya Goto will be speaking on U.S.-Japanese relations. And then at 8 o'clock in the Sun Room, Jane Cortez will be giving a lecture on economy, ecology, and poetry. Richard Walker received his bachelor's degree in economics from Stanford University and his PhD in geography and environmental engineering from Johns Hopkins University. He has written two books, The Capitalist Imperative, Territory, Technology, and Economic Growth, as well as The New Social Economy, Reworking the Division of Labor. Dr. Walker is currently a professor of geography at the University of California at Berkeley and is also the editor of the journal Antipode. It is my pleasure to produce to you Dr. Richard Walker. Thank you, Laura. Thank you all for having me here. Uh, my roots in Iowa go back a long way. I have uh, great grandparents who were born and raised in Iowa before we drifted west into that other world of California. I want to talk today about the new geography of the world economy, and I have a lot to say, so I'll talk fast. You'll have to bear with me. Uh, I want to make a case that the changing geography of the world is deeply tied in with the changing economy of the world, and that in turn with the politics of the world. And in that argument, I want to make clear to you that the map of the world has changed very dramatically over the last couple of decades, particularly felt strongly in the 80s, and that the United States has not fared well in that redrawing of the map. So I guess uh, given that the presidential election is upon us, and that during this election the issue of the American economy has finally resurfaced after years of being neglected, it's about time that we face up to some of these new geographic realities, some things that some of us in geography and economic geography have been talking about for some time, but I think are just uh, are news still for, to too many people. And I assure you that the uh, country that does not know its geography well and its new global geography is in a lot of trouble. So part of what we have to do is simply come to grips with the changes in the world. Secondly, we need to understand what's behind them, and particularly the changes in production systems, ways of making things and doing things in the economy that are so fundamental to the redrawing of the map. And then behind that, I think we have to understand a bit of the politics that, uh, that shapes and drives those economic and geographical changes. Well, first let me lay out just briefly where we stand historically. 
Uh, Ernst Mandel is going to be here later in the week, so, uh, so he can do a better job than I on the nature of the last 50 years and what is often called the long wave. So there's no question that this period has a coherence, that we stand at the end of a long epoch and possibly at the beginning of a new one. Uh, we stand at a period that's uh, experiencing dramatic restructuring of world capitalism. <laughs> The redrawing of the world map is not just a political question of the new countries that are appearing in the former Soviet Union. It's something that's been going on within the capitalist system for quite some time, quite apart from the new frontiers of capitalism in the old cap communist countries. And I think uh, the overwhelming impression I, I want to give you is that the United States and the capitalist world is really staggering into the 90s. Certainly, after World War II, things looked very rosy for the U.S. It looked very rosy for most of the advanced countries as they got back on their feet after the devastation of World War II. Uh, there were very high growth rates from 1945 to about 1970. On the average of perhaps 3.6% um, is the figure I have for 1950 to 1973. That growth rate in the advanced countries has slowed down to 2% between 1973 and 1989, it'd be worse if you took the figures through 1992. That is, on the whole, the first two and a half decades, three decades after the war, were a period of pretty robust growth. Of course, uneven amongst the different countries, but pretty robust growth. And with the United States, of course, standing astride that as a kind of world colossus. Since 1970, we've had a series of very deep recessions very serious downturns, and much more sluggish growth, approaching in some cases to a kind of feeling of stagnation. The big recessions, of course, are 73, 75, 80 to 82, and now 89 to 92, and perhaps into 93, at the rate we're going. Now, there's a number of views of where this long downswing comes from, and I won't belabor these, but I will mention them. Uh, there's, a, there's the Keynesian view, which I think uh, someone like John Kenneth Galbraith, who spoke the other night, might embrace, that simply there's a sense of stagnation in investment, that uh, capitalists have not been investing in the right ways and the right things. And there's good reasons to think that there's, there's truth to that. There's a lot of truth to that because of diversion of investment into speculative activities in the 80s. A second version is, is the Schumpeterian, Joseph Schumpeter, who argued that periods of economic growth are driven by rapid technical change and by bursts of technological innovation. And this feeling was that technology, there was a huge wave of new technologies came in, in and around World War II. The spreading of the old Fordist mass production technologies out of the United States into Europe and into Japan in a way they hadn't spread before. And that that drove the long period of growth. And that that ran out of steam in the last two decades. The problem with that theory is that, is that there's been enormous technological change in the last two decades. Enormous new uh, frontiers in productivity, which I'll come back to, which belies some view of technology having run out, technology having drifted off. Though, of course, the key question is always rates of technological change. There's another view, a third view, that's a kind of institutional view that's been very popular lately on the left, goes under the name of the regulation theory or the social structures of accumulation associated with members of the, uh, the ERPI school or the Radical Political Economy Association. And that is that there was an accord between capital and labor after World War II and other kinds of balances, institutional fabrics built in, social relations that help to balance the system against its worst excesses, which capitalism does have, and that that balance has come apart, that there's been a breakup of that capital labor accord, uh, driving down of wages, disintegration of unions, certainly true. The problem with that theory is it's more an effect than a cause. And the basic cause of the long wave, I would argue, goes back to the old theory of Karl Marx, of a falling rate of profit, 
And surprisingly, in this age, when Marxism is now dead by all declarations, uh, there's some excellent work, actually the best work that's ever been done in economics, showing that indeed the rate of profit has been falling throughout the capitalist world since at least the late 1960s, and in some versions since World War II. And that's really undeniable kind of uh, fact of economic life. And it's one that I want to note because it, it helps explain some of the uh, desperate politics of our age and the, the reactions that the capitalists have taken here and elsewhere in response to the sort of dire straits of this decline, this slow, gradual decline in the rate of profit, which itself is due overwhelmingly to overinvestment, too much capital having been created in a variety of ways. I'll come back to that. So as the world economy started to decline the last two decades, we got a curious phenomenon in the 1980s, what you might call a false boom, in which a number of policies were implemented, tax cuts, deregulation, under the Reagan umbrella, which stimulated short-term activity that was highly speculative, highly skewed towards luxury consumption, and in the end had almost no effect on the underlying decline of the rate of profit. And at the end of that false boom, it seems very hollow. And in the 90s, we're sort of looking here in this recession at the wreckage of that period, the sort of toxic waste of the false economy of the 1980s. That is, collapse, savings and loans, closed banks like the Bank of New England, tight credit. You can lower interest rates as far as you want these days and it doesn't stimulate any new economic activity because the financiers are so afraid of making new loans and isn't obvious what, the, what they should be making loans for. Consumers are overstretched, governments are overstretched and deficits growing and we have a general sense of financial calamity all around us. Which makes this recession look curiously stagnant. And of course, of course, coming from California, we're the last ones to got, get the recession. California has been sort of the bright light of the American economy for the last 20 years, far and away the fastest growth, the most manufacturing development, high-tech, aerospace, and it's all coming apart at the seams right now. And I might add, it's ungovernable thanks to all our wonderful innovations from Proposition 13 to term limitations um, and our, you know, our contributions to the American political scene from Star Wars to Silicon Valley fever. Well, we in California have a lot to answer for, so I'm here to try and make some amends. Um, let me talk about the new geography now that emerges at the end of this period. There are about five major tendencies I'd like to emphasize. The first is Globalization. Well, we hear a lot about globalization, and we know it means several things. It means an internationalization of trade. It means a growing internationalization of production. It means a growing internationalization of finance. And finally, as an effect of all those, a growing internationalization of competition. Well, that has happened. That has grown, although it is curious that uh, you know globalization kind of hits hits home. When it hits home in the United States, that's when we become acutely aware of it. Uh, the indigenous peoples of the Americas were well aware of globalization about 500 years ago. But um, this new sort of level of globalization is pinching the shoe of, a, of the American economy rather tightly. Um, and the American economy has not done particularly well in this, in this uh, growth with our foreign direct investment, our corporations leading the way of the internationalization after World War II in that first 20, 30 year period. And since then, retreating relatively to the direct investment, financial investment, corporate extension of other economies, particularly the Japanese and the German. And I could bore you with the figures, but I think I won't in the interest of time. Um, actually, we hear a lot about the internationalization of production that's produced that's created this system of new industrial, a new industrial division of labor 
of parts of production systems, uh, part pieces of multinationals all over the globe now, uh, integrated by very complex trade flows. We heard a little about that last night from Professor Jones. Trade flows of intermediate goods that makes world trade, world production look quite different than it did even 20 years ago. So that's a, dramatic, that's a dramatic change. Although the production part of internationalization has been swamped in the 1980s by the financial internationalization. We now see $1 trillion per day traded in currency markets, which is vastly more than the amount of trade per year. I think it's about 15 times the quantity of trade per year is in the currency ex transactions per day. But I will retreat from saying there's globalization to say we can't, there's a lot of global babble these days about globalization that's, and capital mobility, that's the only thing we need to know about. And that's not true. And the argument I also want to make here very strongly as a geographer is the specificity of the geographic changes, of the economic changes. And that's what I will emphasize from here on out. One of the specificities is the global shift in the center of world production and accumulation from the United States to Japan. The Japan will pass the United States in industrial output in about five years. It'll pass us in GNP in about 10 years. I don't know if that's news, but uh, it's clear that the 21st century will be the Japanese century uh, more than, well, this one was the American century or the American half century. I guess that's about all we got. The Japanese are investing twice as fast as the U.S. in terms of the percentage of GNP. They've gained in sector after sector, steel, uh, cars, machinery, consumer electronics, uh, certain forms of computers and uh, semiconductors. Not every sector by any means, but a whole host of sectors that were once thought to be you know, the American domain. They've done it through a variety of strategies, uh, which I can't enumerate here, which make up a quite substantial national package of production systems, of industrial planning, of financial control, and so forth. And we suffer from great many delusions about this. Delusions like, um, I saw some figures in the papers the other day, the other day that said, well, U.S. Productivity is really higher than the Japanese today, still. Well, la di da. The reason for that is because the Japanese protect agriculture and they still, and they still protect a lot of small business that has very low uh, labor productivity. But in the key sectors, the key industrial sectors, their productivity has surged ahead of ours in one place after another. Quality of products better, innovation rates faster. And their response even to, to things like the recession, has been much more nimble than ours. The Japanese have just introduced a, a rather huge injection of investment, public investment into the economy to try to stimulate it after the stock market collapsed there <coughs> last year, something that the U.S. may get around to. Meanwhile, of course, the U.S. has been declining, and uh, we've gone from 40% of the world's industrial output at the end of World War II to about 20%, maybe 18, I think it is now. We've gone from the world's largest creditor, the world's largest debtor. We borrowed $1 trillion on world capital markets in the 1980s. Our trade deficit in the 1980s ran about $1 trillion. That's a lot of money. And we've lost domestic market share in 28 industrial sectors, essentially almost all industrial sectors. In fact, it would be worse if it weren't for globalization. The spread of Japanese investment into the United States has actually propped up a great, much of, a great deal of our industry. There's been a substantial replacement of major heavy industry sectors in the core of the United States, in the Midwest, by Japanese companies. Not just automobiles, but in rubber products, in steel, and in auto parts and probably other sectors as well that haven't been studied, but that's just one study I know of. Almost the entire capacity that was closed in the 1980s in the core of the American economy was reopened as Japanese plants.
There has also been, along with the shift from the United States to Japan, a global shift from the Atlantic to the Pacific. The center of world capitalism keeps moving west. The world center of trade is now the Pacific. The world center of production is now around the Pacific Basin and includes not just Japan, but of course these new centers of accumulation, the Ford Tigers, and this very dramatic spread of production into Southeast Asia. Very dynamic economic zone. I should add, in addition to this shift, there has been a kind of reconsolidation of the advanced economies into the global center and pulling back from most of the global peripheries that have been developing in the 1950s and 60s, and the opening up of a few new select peripheral areas. About 80% of that globalization of trade and investment and so on and production is amongst the advanced countries. So very little of it actually goes out to the third world. Much of the third world has been written off as a result of uh, hasty lending, excessive and foolish lending by the American banks and world banks uh, in the 1980s, 70s, that came a cropper in the 1980s. As a result, the per capita gross domestic product of the third world has fallen from 1960 to 1990 as a percent of developed countries, from 9% to about 6%. But we do have this selective in moving out, tongues of the advanced capitalist system moving into places like Hong Kong, into Malaysia, into parts of Indonesia, into the Dominican Republic, while other parts have pulled back. And of course, we have the three great new frontiers of the 1990s and beyond, I suppose, that is opening up the, Soviet, the former Soviet Union for resource exploitation and skilled labor, the opening of China and in its sort of market Stalinism that it now has, which has actually become an important capitalist competitor and capitalist frontier, there, um, a friend of mine, Eric Wright, does studies of uh, class structure around the world. He was quite shocked to discover in the mid-'80s that there were more capitalists in China than in any other country in the world. And, of course, there's India, which is now opening itself increasingly to the world, not a place we think about too much in terms of the global economy, but potentially extraordinarily important. There is, along with this globalization and this shifting center and this selective re reorientation of the global core, there is a global partition going on. Dramatic, most dramatically, the European community and its consolidation of its collective borders around that core Franco-German alliance, which is itself a kind of internationalization at a regional level, and particularly an internationalization of successful firms by the capitalists not so much by labor. It's an internationalization to take advantage of, of European markets, as larger as the companies have gotten more productive, of take advantage of southern European labor for certain parts of the production process. It's also produced by the, the continuing decline of the UK and its retreat into Europe as a way of protecting itself in a world it can no longer compete in very well. Then we have the North American Free Trade Alliance, which you've heard about yesterday, so I will not belabor that, but it's essentially a kind of imitation of Europe. It's an American response and a Mexican response coming together, thinking that, aha, the Europeans have the answer. If we can just create that kind of a block, we can beat the Europeans at their own game. We can contain this kind of rampaging global competition protect ourselves to a certain degree and, and give ourselves an internal advantage within this larger uh, region. Now my general cut on, on NAFTA is that it is a reaction by the capitalists of the United States and Mexico who can't think of something better to do. That is, it is not the most creative possible response and in as many ways a lame response to their own inability to advance their forces of production and develop their economies competitively on this global playing field. The third trading block, of course, is East Asia, 
where Japanese have extended their production apparatus all throughout Southeast Asia. Now, there won't be a formal trading block there, I don't think, because the legacy of Japanese imperialism of the early 20th century is still seared on people's minds, and there isn't anybody going to sort of get in bed with Japan. Uh, I criticize the United States a lot, but of course, one could do the same for Japan or France or any number of other advanced countries that have a lot to answer for. But at any rate, the Japanese and also Chinese capital, overseas Chinese capital, going back into China, as well as developing in its own centers, as well as now investing in North America, forms another huge uh, developing area of East Asia that is a challenge to North America and Europe. Now, those kinds of changes, those very large changes, are ones I think you're rather familiar with, you've heard a lot about. But I also want to stress that there's a, a great many more fine-grained changes going on at regional levels, sub-national levels, that are absolutely central to this process of economic restructuring, economic change before us. And we see not just national shifts, but we see shifts within countries. Uh, talking about NAFTA yesterday, northern Mexico is clearly the key area in the development of the new Mexico, the new free trade Mexico. Um, within the United States, California and the Dallas area of North Texas have been really central to the, to the shifts into new areas of production. Um, within Britain, you see that southeast England is where the action is, and the north, northern tier of England and Scotland have been written off, essentially, as old industrial areas. We see even very subtle shifts, but very dramatic shifts in something like Midwestern auto production. From the north Midwest, the center of the center of gravity is shifting south because that's where the, the tier of Japanese plants and their suppliers and their new steel mills and so on are tending to locate. So there's a very dramatic sub-regional shift, which of course has huge impact on who gets the jobs, on the unions, on, on degrees of unionization, on the politics, local politics in response to industry and so on. Not to mention just on economic growth rates state by state. There are changes at the, at the metropolitan level, something like the opening of Silicon Valley out in my area, San Francisco Bay Area, that just added this whole new urban cluster onto the edge of an existing metropolitan area. The same thing happened in Orange County outside Los Angeles, opened up by the new electronics industry. So a new industrial space there on the metropolitan fringe. You can see it in Iowa with the reshuffling of small towns around such things as the dramatic transformation of meatpacking in the last 20 years led by Iowa beef, where some towns like Ottumwa have just been crushed. Their production has been snuffed out for reasons having to do with new product lines, new companies, uh, vicious sort of anti-union strategies by the new dynamic capitalists in that, in that industry. So, and the whole meatpacking industry has been shifted over from its center, which used to be in the prairies and around Chicago, to the Great Plains. And now that may not mean much to Californians, but it means a lot when you live out here. So, just to sum up on those geographic changes, is that the I want to emphasize the continuing unevenness of this capitalist development process at any number of levels. And it's very complex to peel back the map of the world, especially as it's changing so dramatically, and see the different la levels of the different patterns at different levels. So there's a lot of work in that area. And it's also, I want to emphasize the importance of of place shifts, of new places or restructured places as a part of that process of opening up new industries, opening up new production processes, closing down old ones, so that the pieces of the chessboard, of the capitalist chessboard, are constantly being moved around in this strategic effort to keep profits up and accumulation going. 
quite a different view, I might add, than we got from John Kenneth Galbraith on Sunday night of a kind of just gentle spreading out of production around the world. That's not how it works. And the old core areas don't always survive. And there are plenty of examples at the regional level of areas that were once industrialized that are no longer industrialized. Like North Wales, one of the leading areas of the first industrial revolution. Very nice countryside now. It's very picturesque and an occasional smokestack still standing. Now, these geographic changes are very much wrapped up with changes in production. And I want to stick, there's many other things I could say about economic change, but I do want to stick to this, quickly to this production base. Well, not so quickly. I can see I'm not being so quick. Um, and I don't want to leap to government policy and politics immediately, because I think well, we tend to be very glib about the underlying fabric of production and how important it is to our lives. Um, and I find that problem with, with a lot of economists, particularly ones who are not very geographic in their orientation, including some we've heard from this week, whose view tends to be operate at the level of, well, markets and trade or macroeconomic policy with very little understanding of the specifics, the concrete specifics of how you make things and, and what kind of things you make and where you make them and who you use with what technologies and what skills. Those things are critical to this redrawn map of the world. Let me just give a few examples, very broad brush, of the kinds of changes one sees as the economy develops, as the economy responds to this long-term crisis. One simple strategy is writing off of capital. If you can write off capital, if you can get rid of old capital, you can get your rate of profit up. Or if its rate of profit is no good, I mean, in terms of the individual capitalist, if your rate of profit is insufficient, you close the plant. You shut down the industry. You have layoffs. You stop producing that good. Well, that's happened, of course, and we have massive deindustrialization throughout the 80s um, in places like northern England, in Pittsburgh or Buffalo, which has simply been written off the industrial map for the time being, the shrinkage of places like Cleveland to half their former size. But even place, um, formerly sort of inviolable edifices of American capitalism like IBM are suffering layoffs and cutbacks. Wang Electronics and the Route 128 around Boston is, is bankrupt, and in fact the Route 128 area is shrinking right now despite its earlier phenomenal growth as an electronics center, which goes to show you how hard it is to maintain growth sometimes. When you think you've got it, you may not. Um, a second thing you can do to try and get the rate of profit up or to try to open up new fields is, is resource exploitation. This one tends to get overlooked. It's kind of old-fashioned. Uh, it's certainly how we got going out in California. The California gold rush is what uh, brought us into the advanced capitalist system from which we've never been departed since. And it's been an old one going back to the time of the Fuggers and the gold mines of Central Europe in the 1400s. But it goes on today, too. We see vast new timber plantations opening up in places like Portugal or Chile. We see um, huge new gold mines in Papua New Guinea. Um, we see Chevron Oil trying to overcome some of its profit problems by signing contracts with Tajikistan in the former Soviet Union to extract their considerable oil revenues. And let me tell you, when Weyerhaeuser gets its hands on the Russian Siberian forests, uh, it'll be another Amazon deforestation. You know, important forests don't have to be in the tropics. We wiped out the biggest, I think the third biggest forest in the world, of course, is North America, which we cleared off a couple hundred years ago. A third reaction and third kind of strategy would be intensified labor exploitation. That's a, that's a good old standard, and it works. It works for a lot of sectors. It works for a lot of companies. You can go to Southeast Asia for your electronics assembly. You can go to Mexico for your garment work. Um, you can go to Morocco for a computer assembly if you're a French computer company. And indeed, you can get cheap labor and often very good labor, and so the rate of exploitation goes up, your profits are improved. You can do it internally, what I might call the East Los Angeles model. 
millions of people pouring into the United States, many of peasant poor extraction, were willing to work at very low rates of pay, and we've had humongous growth. That's not an acceptable ac academic word. We've had enormous growth of the garment industry, of electronics assembly, of furniture uh, in California, say, based on this massive influx of the new immigration. So you don't have to go abroad in order to find cheap labor. Now, those are the strategies, those three strategies of deindustrialization and resource exploitation and labor exploitation are the ones you hear the most about, I think, from, from critics from the left like myself. But there's much more to it than that because there's a, there's a progressive side to capitalism, the constant revolutionizing of production. And again, very broad brush, we have a number of strategies on this side. The new models of, there are some basic new models of factory level production. The Japanese growth of the last several decades, phenomenal growth, has been based overwhelmingly on very, the development of extremely effective labor systems in mass production, based around a number of things of low inventories, um, reducing the porosity of labor, sharing in, in uh, labor teams, sharing work, uh, continuous improvement or the Kaizen system, less pre-engineering, rapid retooling to change your model lines, a number of things that fit together in a very tight package, I might add, a very tight package when it's done right, that makes Japanese mass production more efficient than the old Fortis mass production, the old Fortis assembly lines that the U.S. invented in the early 20th century. There's also been some revolutionary developments in batch production, that is, smaller quantities. And there's a lot of confusion about this. Let me just say that flexible production, you sometimes hear about the term flexible specialization or flexible production, that's about batch production. Mass production has become somewhat more flexible too, but it's not like flexible production has passed up mass production. Some people say that, but that's confused. It's, it's that batch production has become more efficient I noticed I've been looking over here. I'm, my apologies to everyone over there. I'll try to give the second half of the talk to this side of the room. Um, the batch production itself in areas like machining has become more efficient and producing better quality products. There's, by the way, a whole series of other things that are going on that I can't go into um, in terms of better machinery, uh, better quality control in a number, of, a number of sectors, from steel to ships to medical instruments. But those are the main ones. And you know, those have produced very dramatic shifts internationally and at the regional level. There's been quite a development within Italy. There was a very dramatic shift from northern Italy as the center of industrialization to the central Italy, where these new batch production methods have been developed very effectively. There's the opening up of new technological realms, we'll call it, which is, what I might say, sort of new product areas uh, based on wholly new kind of ca capacities, technical capacities, scientific capacities. Uh, the obvious one is electronics. There's something we couldn't do before in microelectronics. Um, possible new ones, ones that are just opening up are biotechnology, micro-machinery, um, some, some lesser ones that you maybe haven't heard of are, are plastic metal laminates in the material sector. So there's some very dramatic sort of technological changes going on as well that open up new fields of activity. And this, again, is tied to geographic shifts. Uh, the rise of Silicon Valley is fundamentally based on this new technology. We hear a lot about Silicon Valley being produced by the new entrepreneurism and the small firms and the market and high competition. There's something to that. It's a very open organizational system. And that has something to do with its dynamism. Okay? And, it's, and it's kept up rather well with the Japanese despite all predictions of decline in the face of the ability of the Japanese to match to produce semiconductors. Silicon Valley keeps going on to new things, uh, new kinds of computers, new kinds of disk drives, new software. It's been quite amazing and, and resilient. On the other hand, I think we can't forget that what these guys are doing is essentially exploiting a fundamental of technology. So it, 
Exploitation is a term we don't want to lose sight of here. It isn't just their personal brilliance. They are riding a very good horse. There are new divisions of labor. The economy keeps opening up whole new fields of activity, not just product areas, but areas um, within manufacturing, within the older you know, economy as we've known it, uh, like uh, huge new developments in, in research and development that have grown up over the last several decades, uh, huge growth of business services that are complements to management, um, terrific growth of finance or uh, s other kinds of circulation activities in the financial sphere or in the, in the real product sphere, which are themselves associated with things like new clusters of warehouses, uh, new retail spaces like the West Edmonton Mall that, that actually alter regional geographies quite dramatically, or uh, you know, new financial activities like trading in futures that has allowed Chicago's financial center to keep, keep growing, to add a new layer of growth in competition with New York's, and so on. Um, and finally, very important and maybe I think much neglected, is the idea of new forms of organization. That perhaps the most fundamental change of our time is not new machinery, that is a computer-driven machinery, or simply uh, lean uh, or effective use of labor, say teamwork, uh, Japanese participatory systems of labor application, but is actually the way you weave together complex social labor systems. And I've written a rather long and tedious book on this, but I think that there's something to it, that as the economy has grown over the years, we now produce something like six million different commodities. Every commodity system is divided into piece after piece after piece. And you, in order to produce anything effectively, in order to, to, to conceive of it, to research it, to design it, to market it, to manage it, you have to administer, put together and administer very complex production systems. And that is a realm in which very strong advances are being made. And some of the sort of obvious ones would be something like the retail systems run by the Gap or by Benetton, where they use a pull-through system from the point of retail all the way back to production. Or the Nike system of, of managing a very complex array of tennis shoes. Doesn't sound like much, but Nike has the most amazing system of globalized production in which it allocates different bits to different places and manages them, puts in different kind of machinery, different design processes and different labor systems at different rates of pay and so on, according to the particular kind of tennis shoe and what kind of market it has. It's an amazing system which has a very specific geography, much too complex to go into now. The Benetton system is much simpler. They get almost all their stuff out of an area called the Veneto around Venice in Italy and pump it all over the world into all those stores where they, you know, if you have a green stripes they're selling this week, they'll order more green stripes sweaters or red stripes or whatever. The same thing's happening in agriculture with very sophisticated systems of directed by either by wholesalers or by retail stores that go produce fresh fruits and vegetables now all over the globe for you know, short-term flight back to the developed countries for winter vegetable consumption, or I, I should add flowers are in this. So you can have something like in West Kenya, there are, they are growing flowers that are flown overnight to London for the London flower market. So if you go buy a bouquet in a little cart in London or in San Francisco or in Des Moines, it's coming in from Kenya or Colombia or Mexico or, or Southern California, Oklahoma, some other places. And those systems are incredibly well integrated for very rapid response, very quick turnaround. And also, the contracts specify very carefully how you produce your fruit, your vegetable, under what conditions, with what pesticides, with what fertilizers, with what seed. And they manage to administer that whole system. And the farmer becomes someone who just contracts and takes orders from this distant management. It gives a whole new twist to the problem of, of management. Management, we tended to think of in terms of the factory floor, but in complex contracting systems, it's at a great remove. It's not quite the market, and it's not quite the factory. It's a whole new world, and it makes for a very, very uh, important new geography.
Well, again, more of those, but I'm running late. So, what I try to say here is that there's whole new fronts along which capitalism is advancing at its productive base, and I include in production organization as well, and that that's having specific geographic implications that produce that kind of new mapping of the world economy, that it combines a, a wide front of strategies. I don't want to just say, hey, it's cheap labor, it's cost-cutting that drives the system. I think we, we, we exaggerate that in the United States because our companies have often been very laggard, and I'll get to that. So the cost-cutting, the cheap strategy has dominated. But there's no doubt that capitalism walks on two legs. It continues to walk on that, that one leg of exploitation of labor, exploitation of nature, and the other leg of advance, of progress, of new ideas. And that's what makes the system such a puzzle. But as it walks, it actually walks.